I am so excited. I am such a big fan. I love Neil deGrasse Tyson. Here he is. Neil, how are you, my friend? Anthony, you're still at it. <laughs> I, I am still at it. I I love doing this. It's uh, been a you know, while. it's my passion, as they say. We were just talking about, of course, the um, 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and uh, the atomic bomb. I, especially in this day and age, am very surprised in 75 years it hasn't been used again with the insanity that goes on in this world. We seem to have this one little sliver of common sense that let us all know that would be mutually assured destruction. So um, that's a good thing, I guess, in these we're, most we're, tumultuous we're times. Alive. In spite of ourselves, I think that's how you need to. Think in spite about it. of ourselves, like and that. and it is amazing. What amazed me though was uh, again the engineering of it. You could say what you want about how horrific that that mechanism is, and it is. But the engineering that went behind the Manhattan Project, the the length of time it took to go from a theory to a practical working device. No, uh, it's, it was even more stunning than that. So, for example, you remembered that there was uranium and plutonium. Yeah, uh, you, I, I, I heard part of your, your bit. You give a, a little physics one on one. So that's good. Uh, so uh, uranium was known to be highly fissionable. And so when they made the uranium bomb, they didn't have to test it. And they didn't. They didn't have to. And they didn't. Plutonium as an element on the periodic table had only just been discovered in 1940. Amazing. So we went from the, the discovery of a new element on the periodic table to a weapon in five years. And the test at Trinity Point near Almogordo, New Mexico, that original test wasn't to test the uranium. We had good confidence in that. It was to test the plutonium. And so to drop two bombs was then a demonstration that both of these materials would work in that way. Yeah, and, and the idea that both of these bombs, the one from uh, Hiroshima and the one from Nagasaki, uh, were two completely different types of designs. One yes. was an implosion uh, device, which which uh, crushed the, the core to a critical mass, and the other was a almost a, a rail gun, kind of a cannon, which shot two of these pieces together uh, separately. They weren't a critical mass, but when slammed together, it made that critical mass cause the chain reaction. So again, that is pretty amazing to not only come up with a bomb, but you came up with two different ways of detonating this atomic uh, fission bomb. And so before you years give later, we have a cold that won't go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> so before you give the, the human uh, species as much credit as you have for not destroying ourselves, let me add a, a nuance to this. So while a nuclear weapon is, those are the big muscles on the block, right? That's the bully. What happened over the decades, not only through the Cold War, but especially afterwards, is that our weapons started gaining higher and higher precision mm. with their intent. And when you have high precision, if, so if you want to take out a depot, you want to take out a, a, a field of tanks, you want to take out a headquarters, you just do that. You don't level the entire city. Right. right? Then what do you have? You have a, a radioactive city where you've killed 100,000 people. Now what are you going to do? So in terms of strategic and tactical weaponry, the the atomic bomb was re, was pretty quickly rendered pointless <laughs> in terms of military strategy other than the mutual assured destruction. Yeah. Where every, if, you know, it's like, you can't play with my toy. I'll die with my toys. How, how does that go when you're a kid? You, um, uh, yeah, you can't play with my toys. I'll break them before you can play with them. Right, right. right. Yeah. That's, it's very juvenile in, in concept. But in modern times, precision missile guidance and targeting yeah. is really where the future of this kind of warfare is going, not let me destroy your whole city. Yeah, it, it really is amazing that uh, after we used the atomic bomb in, in, in a war um, against other people, uh, the bomb pretty much became a political device more than a military weapon device for all the years through the Cold War and up until, uh, well, till this day still, when you look at places like North Korea and whatnot, um, it's still being used as a political uh, device more than a military one. 
Yeah, I think that's an insightful point. It's, it's more of, it gives politicians, um, <clears throat> it makes them feel stronger walking into a room where they're about to negotiate anything that they want to negotiate. Right. But if, if you speak to generals and, you know, and folks who are with boots on the ground, this, this is not, you know, uh, plus since when would you drop such a bomb and have it only kill the military part of what it is that you're fighting? Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, it levels everything, including right. innocent people who are <laughs> caught up in it. So, so I'd like, so, so you're trying to give us credit for not using it. It's, it's not, I'm not going to give us that much credit. <laughs> I'm going to say we invented ways to still accomplish what we want without having a level in True. We, we will always invent uh, great, wonderful, um, uh, amazingly innovative ways to kill each other. I, and I, and I got I one just, just to fill in where you were coming from. The, the transitional concept, think about it, was the neutron bomb. Yes. Remember that? Destroying uh, or killing the people, but keeping the cities intact. Right, because you want to move into the buildings. Why? Why destroy right. buildings? That's that's a you know the buildings don't align with an enemy or a fo you know friend or foe. It's just a building. So but there is there is an episode of Star Trek. If you uh, were a Star Trek fan, where uh, war had became so antiseptic and so clinical, uh, and didn't destroy buildings or cultures or artwork, that the war lasted forever. And Kirk and Spock had to go in and destroy the computers that ran this computerized war. They would calculate how many people would have died in a bomb strike or what have you and then have the people just report to these disintegration chambers and Kirk goes no you need the horrors of war and and it was such a great episode because uh they panicked when he shot up the computers and, and they said now you've done it now we're in a real war he goes well yeah or you could get on the blower there and call your your guys you're warring with and maybe put a stop to this thing. And well, it was of, so first telling. First of all, Anthony, I'm insulted that you had to wonder whether I was a Star Trek fan. Just, <laughs> I just know, that right? Out. Jesus. <laughs> I, 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 I apologize, Neil. <laughs> okay, so that's first. Second, yeah, that was one of the greater episodes, I yes. think. One of the more uh, more deeply philosophical, cultural episodes. Very of the right day, the very Cold War, very of the time, yeah. Yes, yes, and... Um, there was, oh, by the way, just to, to take a, what seems like a complete off ramp, but it's not. Um, f for my podcast, Star Talk, I interviewed yeah. um, the creator of Game of Thrones. Okay, uh, he was criticized. He and the whole production for HBO um, was criticized for how bloody, mm. explicitly bloody, the portrayals were of people dying. And they said, "This is violence. How could you do this? This is bad." This, and you know what he said? He said. Um, that the history of television death, where you just point the gut at someone and then they just fall over, <laughs> that's a lie. That's what's desensitizing you to mm. death. And it, you want to you want to know that the bullet ripped through flesh and you have bone and structure hanging out of your body. Yeah, you want to know that so that you will know not to do that. He was he was strongly adamant about this, and and I, I had no rebuttal. It's like, yeah, you're kind of right about this. Yeah. Okay. You're saying this is uh, you shoot someone, they fall, and that's how you should show violence. No, show it how you how it really is. Hey, they I will see, know I, and understand it. I see. And that, that uh, comes out of that out of that Star Trek episode. That's a good point. I though. see Mannix get shot five times a week, and uh, he seems to be fine. <laughs> old, the, the old Mannix show on MeTV. Uh, oh, wait, Anthony, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> We're probably pretty close there, Neil. I got to tell you. I love Which, saying that, though, to people my age. Oh, I know. Which leads me to the next thing. Um, we, we'll get away from this death and destruction thing. That's a really good point, though, I just want to say. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because like, when you're young and you watch cartoons like G.I. Joe and stuff, yeah, that's what happens. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's fine. It's It desensitizes. Uh, uh, away from some of the death and destruction and something more optimistic, uh, space, our space program, um, SpaceX, I mean, this Crew Dragon uh, experiment that they did uh, recently, um, we, we saw th these two astronauts go up to the space station. They came back in that Crew Dragon capsule, which just looked so cool. Uh, I, I think the technology we've gotten in the past, just even a little over a decade, this autonomous 
technology, uh, GPS combined with computers, allowing these machines to do most of the work. Uh, is a, just an amazing thing. We saw it in our, our own recreation with drones. I was a, a big drone fan. I, I had them when you had to actually put them together, put the guidance system on, uh, the, uh, the motor controllers, uh, and it was very um, trial and error. But now you can buy a consumer drone that is completely autonomous. You're just punching in coordinates. It will go there. It will land automatically. It's got sensors so it doesn't crash into things. I, I, I'm thrilled with this. And we're seeing it being used in transportation, car technology these days with automatic parking. And the space program has really picked this up. Uh, the way the Crew Dragon docks with the space station, I mean, it's relatively hands-off. Yeah, so just to put some of this in context, consider, um, given how old you are, you'll remember when the radio <laughs> was the biggest furniture in the living room. I knew Marconi. I was his intern. <laughs> <laughs> so you can ask the question, whatever would motivate someone to make the radio small? I mean, just ask yourself that. There's no strong urge for that to happen unless there is an urge, okay? And so here's the urge. When we started going into space, the cost of a payload is huge mm. per ounce, per pound. Today, it's still $10,000 a pound to put anything in orbit, okay, as a payload. So NASA and other sort of space efforts went on a miniaturization um, path, to make the same product lighter, uh, smaller, so that you could fit it into the capsule or into whatever was your payload and then send that into space. So the early miniaturization of electronics was, was stimulated, deeply stimulated by the needs of the space program. Then when you realize the radio is now small enough that it can fit in your hand. Let's put a clip on it and put it on your pocket, okay? <laughs> yeah. And now you've got a transistor radio. And, oh, now we can put songs in there. Let's make the Sony Walkman, all right? And then you put a CD in there. Now you have the what was then the iPod. And now, so, 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 so I think you said it backwards. You're saying, oh, that space is taking advantage of the fact that these little things can fit and do all of the, no, no, space has been a driver for so much of this over over so many decades. Yeah, that is true. The, um, the, the Arguably, the transistor is the greatest innovation of the 20th century for um, for everything we, we use transistors in. Uh, when you look at the old the old tubes and uh, the, the technology we had before the transistor was, they, they, it was impossible to do so many of the things we do right now. Um, and by the way, it wasn't just because the transistor miniaturized tubes. It also changed the power requirements. And the speed, yeah. Okay, so the tubes generated heat, which means you needed cooling fans and air conditioners for the largest of the computers and the machines that would use these tubes. Um, you know, in the old days, TVs got really hot. It, it, like the really old days now. <laughs> I remember cathode ray tubes <laughs> and televisions and, and, and saying like, well, the picture's screwed up. And your dad would go, it's got to warm up. Wait for <laughs> exactly. the TV to warm up. And you're like, what? It's got to warm and now up. Now you have to explain to the next generation why the word tube is in the company's name YouTube. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Think about that. That's true. And then uh, the other thing I remember from television when I was a kid was when you shut it off, you'd stare at that little dot in the middle and <laughs> see how long it stayed there till it would go away. <laughs> it's just things that kids, uh, you know, they don't know these days. It no, it, no, for you, it didn't take much to entertain you, apparently. No, that was just a <laughs> dot on a TV, and I was happy. I could stare at an oscilloscope for hours when I was a kid. Just I mean, That's uh, amazing. I don't quite know why. Um, but, but getting back to your drone, the point is that once you miniaturize things, then you can do other things with it that the inventor of that technology had not imagined. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was the iPhone, if not the miniaturization of multiple components? Not a few years before my first iPhone, I had this full hand-sized GPS locating device, okay? I think it was a Garmin, one of the early Garmin devices. You walk around and everyone was impressed. Yeah, right. It, it gave you your longitude and latitude as you walked around on Earth. That whole thing is now a chip inside your iPhone, and that's not even the most interesting thing your iPhone does. So. Once things miniaturize, then you can be innovative 
about what the next uh, technological and engineering advances will be that will serve civilization. It's so difficult to predict uh, what we will have in the future. When you look back, again, when I was growing up, the the images we had of the 21st century were starkly different than now. Uh, than now. I look outside, I still see telephone poles with wires on them. We just had a tropical storm pass through. Power was out for two days in my neighborhood. I Thank God I have a generator. But, uh, you know, these are things you thought would be a thing of the past. Maybe are you actually thanking this- God for your generator and uh, not your your insights? All right, I'm thanking C- the- Cummins Generators for uh, my <laughs> generator. It's fantastic. <laughs> I was playing no, video but, uh, games and uh, my neighbor were lighting candles <laughs> a point about uh, about this fact um the the two things first future predictors you know futurists tend to get the next five or ten years right but the next 20 to 50 years completely wrong mm. because they only project the next five to ten years as extrapolations of what's going on in that moment yes and so my, my best example of this was in the movie Back to the Future 2, okay? I'm with you. At that time, that movie came out in 1989, I think it was. Yeah. Fax machines were becoming more and more <laughs> sort of part of everyday life, how we communicate and share documents. And that was taking place in the future, yeah. in the year 2015, okay? And so when Marty actually gets fired from his job, yeah. he receives a fax and there's a fax in like four different locations <laughs> in his home because yeah. that's the future. <laughs> it must be. It must be the future. Well, and the TV's the wall. Right, right. The TV's got, the wall, yeah. right? Two so, neckties. So <laughs> Two neckties. You just <laughs> extend what is known yeah. and make more of it, and you think yes. that's what the future is going to be. In the yeah. movie 2001, where that, was, that came out in 1968, a year before we went to the moon, we had computers, okay? But they imagined that the future of computers way 20, 30 years into the future in the year 2001, computers were were big, but they'd be even bigger and that they would control one computer would control the entire ship. Right. And that computer was called HAL. OK, no one imagined the miniaturization of computers. And now everybody has their own computer <laughs> and their own yeah. media that they then consume privately rather than sort of publicly. So, so there's that. But now here's, here's where we really got it wrong in the future that never came. We imagined that energy would cost nothing. Mm. And all the futures that you saw come out of the 1950s and 60s was a future of energy being abundantly available. So motorized walkways, flying cars, um, everything required energy. What we didn't get right was that the cost of information would drop. Mm. And so now information is near zero in cost. And as a result, we are awash in information. We have information technology is the foundation of the modern economy. So, 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 we are much more advanced than people would have imagined in the day in the information dimension of the future yeah. and much more regressed relative to the energy dimension. That's what happened over the last decades. If, wow. if I could bring up Star Trek once again, uh, <laughs> Gene, Gene Roddenberry was, uh, he, he was this guy that had this very um, optimistic view of the future uh, as far as society goes, but some of the technological things, while amazingly innovative, the fact that they had a communicator and a tricorder and never put it together that that would be one one device that would be better than any communicator or tricorder they ever had. <laughs> right, and, and we don't have to go three centuries into the future to get it. Right, We've it's, got it it's now. here. You know what uh, always made me laugh? When Spock or when Kirk would, would go to call Scotty and he'd go, bleep, and you know, the little antenna cover would come up and he'd be going scotty scotty and he's turning an analog knob it was a nokia phone (laughs) yeah it is like they still just had a little analog knob on he's got to tune in scotty on on the ship so again keep it keep in mind that a starship is a thing that is a huge consumer of energy 
right? We, we, we can't do that today. We don't have that much access to energy. Yeah. You know the energy it takes to warp space and to move and have photon torpedoes and all that? We just can't do it. We don't, you know. <laughs> That's a lot of energy. It's now, a lot of energy. Now, the dilithium uh, crystals. <laughs> getting, yeah, dilithium crystals, sir. While getting to uh, into the space thing, um, more uh, current events, uh, Mars. Mars is really uh, picking up some steam here with people. They're, they're seeing things. They're, they're wondering the uh, successes of Elon Musk and SpaceX uh, have gotten people thinking about Mars. There are so many different ideas of how to get to Mars and land people there and set up a type of uh, base, a base of operations where people aren't coming back anytime soon, if ever. A and um, with, the, uh, with the thin atmosphere uh, over there and the, the, the vast difference in, in temperatures uh, and whatnot, uh, what do you think? Because I heard this helicopter uh, theory where NASA is uh, thinking of a helicopter. There, it's a thin atmosphere there. So I would gather it would need huge rotors, have to be very light. And um, what, what are you, what's your take on how we should get there and uh, what you've seen in, in, in your line of work? Okay, your show isn't long enough for me to answer the 12 <laughs> no. questions you, you just go, laid down You go, my there. friend. I I'm love gonna, this. Let me cherry pick them. Okay, so first, yes, the current rover that, that just launched a few days ago um, where, uh, what's the date on this? This is August 6th, of course, it was the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima. So a few days ago, um, NASA launched the next rover. Okay, their, their launch windows to Mars based on the favorable position of Mars relative to Earth in our mutual orbits around the sun. So every two years, uh, 26 months to be precise, the, the configuration is such that you can use a minimum amount of energy to get there. And the way it works is you're putting, you're sending the craft to where Mars will be yes. when it gets there. Amazing. Seven months from now. So this is a huge, a fascinating bit of orbital um, mechanics. But um, point is on that rover, which is going to land the same way the previous one did with like sky cranes and drogue chutes and retro rockets. And Amazing. it worked last time that they're, they're, they're sticking with it. <laughs> they're, they're bringing a, Helicopter. Basically, it's a it's a it's a drone helicopter with counter rotating blades. And so you're right. In the, the atmosphere is like one percent the thickness of our atmosphere. So the, the the it can't weigh very much, and it needs big rotors, and they have to spin really fast. Yeah. So it's a technology demonstration to see if we can do it or do it well. So yes, that's a test. Another test is they have a machine that's going to take the carbon dioxide and separate the carbon from the oxygen. Aha, uh -huh. we're talking terraforming uh, experiment? <laughs> <laughs> you watch too much science fiction. <laughs> I there. love it. Uh, so that, by the way, carbon dioxide is a very tightly bound molecule. So to separate them requires a lot of energy. So it needs, the machine has to be very well designed to do this. And they want to, once you make the oxygen, it's, it's very Mark Watney style, right? What did Mark Watney do? on Mars in the movie, The Martian, he had to make oxygen for himself to survive until he was saved. Mm. So this is a variant on that. So he's taking, separating the oxygen from the carbon so that one day you could breathe the oxygen. This experiment is testing how efficient mm. that is under those conditions. How much oxygen but, you could get out of it, how much energy it takes. Exactly. Uh, if, you if, want to, if, right. You can calculate it, but you want to actually test it. Sure. And that's what, that's what's going to happen there. But in, in addition, you commented correctly oh, that not only is there not much air, the temperatures are very cold. And what does it mean for someone to go there and not come back? Mm. What's what's motivating that? And I can tell you, uh, by the way, people analogize this to the era of the European explorers going across the ocean, not sure. knowing if they'll return. You bring food you think will sustain you. And I'm saying, no, this is nothing like that. Nothing like that. You know why? Because wherever Columbus was going, he kind of knew that wherever he landed, he'd still be able to breathe the air. <laughs> I think pretty much. <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when he landed in the New World, new to Europeans, of course, um, the trees are made out of wood, just the same way the trees were that made his ships. So he could repair his ships. 
There was fruit growing on the vines. Other human beings were there to greet him. So this is not the case going to Mars. <laughs> Mars is supremely hostile to biology and especially to human physiology. So if you're going to go there, I'm not imagining one-way trips for people. Huh. What I am imagining is you go there on a, on a tourist. You know, you go, there's a HAB module, and you live in there, and then you step out and, and bound on the, on, the, on the Martian landscape, and then you come back two years later. I, I can imagine that, but not, not a sustained colony. Maybe a work uh, program where people go there, work at trying to make it a more livable place. But again, you know, I've played enough of these civilization games uh, online to know the number one thing you do when you start is start gathering resources. It's yes, the exactly. first thing you do. I need rocks. I'm mining. I need wood. I'll saw it down. This. <laughs> when you look at every picture that's come back on Mars, and I know we haven't uh, photographed the entire planet in detail. We've gotten close, but there does not seem to be the resources we would need to be self-sufficient there without right, exactly. something coming from Earth. So the way you do that, oh, by the way, the fact that you played all these sim games, I have to ask, did you only just recently exit your parents' basement to do I mean, your podcast? Uh, mentally, yes. <laughs> mentally, I'm still in the basement. I, I was going to tell you about, uh, when you were talking about orbital dynamics and whatnot, uh, there's a program called Kerbal Space Program. And it is... I've heard about that. I've never played it, but I've so heard about it. so good. Really it, good. I mean, the, the gravity is very accurate. The, you build a ship. You have to uh, be... Um, economical with your fuel and weight and uh a new one is coming out next year i believe they're upgrading because it's a relatively old game but man did i spend just days on end with this thing fascinating to to realize uh, and they've had a lot of uh, engineers that have worked for nasa play this thing and go wow so that's this why is you're so pale way. you you haven't been out in the sun for a while <laughs> obviously i uh you know hey it's uh, one thing you could do without wearing a mask so I kind of enjoy it. <laughs> but the um, so what you're really after here is not going there and sending teams of workers to sort of build base camp, which can happen and might happen if it's a visitor's colony. But what you're really after here is uh, you want to terraform Mars. And in terraforming Mars, you turn it into a place that's like Earth. Then you could just step off the ship and walk around. And something they didn't explicitly tell you in Star Trek, because I think they didn't know it yet. They hadn't really wrapped their head around it yet. Had, do you remember that the that whatever planet they landed on, they never wore uh, spacesuits? Well, they, they always didn't... landed on Class M planets, Neil. Correct. So, and with Class <laughs> uh, nitrogen, oxygen, atmosphere, Captain. <laughs> and, and so that led you to think that nitrogen, oxygen, atmospheres, such as Earth's, you just keep looking until you find one and there's one there. And it missed the point or it didn't fully explore the point that the existence of the oxygen in that planet is because there's life. Were there uh, no life on Earth, there would be no oxygen in the atmosphere. Yes. So, so any place they found it, they should have then found um, photosynthesizing plants and all this, but they didn't. There's often they're just rocks and nothing else. Yes. So they, <laughs> they left you thinking that in the random combination of gases that are on planets, that a nitrogen oxygen one was there in common. You just pick one and land there. But no, it's not, it's, it's more to it than that. Yeah, that's why just plopping a uh, con out on SETI Alpha 5 was not a, a merciful thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, it, it is odd how everything on this planet is symbiotic and and uh, it depends on the other thing and and since the the evolution of this planet everything that has happened has brought us to where we are with yes. with this air that's breathable to us and and it's weird because it's almost a chicken and egg kind of a thing was was this a grand plan or did it just come out of happenstance that all of these life forms and 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 other things that put off these various gases and uh created this planet that we're on um yeah. it really so it gets you thinking on, the answer to that depends on how religious you are right exactly and so you can say oh this whole world is designed just for me to survive and thrive and and so that would be a more sort of biblical uh, theological interpretation of the state of the world however when you look at what 
evolution by natural selection does, it selects for life forms that can thrive in a pre-existing environment, an environment that would be hostile to other life forms. Yes. So in fact, something that was unknown in the Bible and unknown until relatively recently in the history of the world is that we've had severe episodes of extinction <laughs> in the history of the fossil record. And in fact, more than 95% of all life forms that ever existed are now extinct. So, so to say that Earth is a perfect haven for life, not really. <laughs> it's still a lot of killing of life. Yes, some of it were asteroids that were just, you just had bad, like they, oh. the dinosaurs had bad luck, okay? <laughs> but if the climate shifts, if the continents move and the conditions are not right for your biology and your physiology, you go extinct. And so what's left over is that which had the capability of exploiting the conditions of that environment. Now, you want to think that the environment was created for you? No, <laughs> you were created for that environment. What an interesting take on that, because... Um, we all know how relatively short a period of time human beings have been on this planet as residents. There's been a lot of that uh, trial and error kind of thing with other species and, and, and uh, uh, life forms on this earth that have been extinct. And, you know, it's kind of pompous to think we wouldn't be just another one of those life forms because of some cataclysmic or even slow change would make this planet more conducive to a completely different life form that would evolve and go, oh, this pl place must have been made just for us. Thinking, <laughs> not thinking that beforehand, how we're thinking right now, that beforehand there were other life forms that perhaps in their own weird way were saying, hey, this is all made for us, I guess. We were made in God's <laughs> image, so we are just saying we are God. The religious aspect. Yes. Yeah. So, so you, can, you can say it was made for you, until the asteroid strikes and then you're extinct. And <laughs> and then, then, what happened? I thought we had a deal. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell happened here? And, and just my, my favorite example of this is take the polar bear, all right? <clears throat> so the polar bear is saying to itself, uh, this whole world is made just for me. <laughs> these sub-freezing <laughs> temperatures, these ice flows, I'm so, and the occasional seal that bobs up for my meals. This is just perfectly designed for me. <laughs> this is what the polar bear is saying. Yeah. And almost all other biological forms would freeze to death under those conditions. Of course. The ocean is another amazing thing. It's part of our planet. It is Earth. There is life in it that is so completely alien. Lovecraft. To how we, yes, to how we... Uh, no life here on, on, on the land. Uh, you know, we're still Not discovering only that, of course, things. More of Earth's surface, as everyone knows, is covered with ocean than is covered with land. Yeah. But on top of that, anyone who lives on land is like on the surface of the land. Some things live below, like mushroom spores and this sort of thing. The root systems go down, but they don't go down very far, all right, compared to the thickness of Earth's crust. So basically, all life on Earth's surface lives on the surface. Whereas life in the ocean, ocean goes five miles down, miles, <laughs> oh my miles. God, yeah. So they not only have more area, they have more depth. So it's not surprising that the biodiversity represented in the ocean um, completely swamps anything you'd find on land. Isn't that and amazing? That's why when you look at fish tanks, you always got to stare at them a little longer. It's like, how the hell do you end up looking like that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, for years, um, and I've, I've been interested in the space program for, for so long, and we've always speculated as to life on another planet, especially in our own solar system. Uh, and, and it was always this science fiction version of some bipedal humanoid figure. Maybe the eyes were bigger or something. But... Uh, when when you include things like some of these bizarre life forms that we can't really comprehend and what we were just talking about, these planets being made just for us uh, in a way where you're looking at some of the you know, some of the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, perhaps. Uh, do you think life in some form could exist on, on those atmospheres within those atmospheres? So let me back up just for a sec. Uh -huh. The answer is yes. But let me let me offer a nuance to that. So getting back to your bipedal uh, Hollywood renderings of aliens, yeah, I, that's one of my great disappointments of Hollywood is how 
unimaginative their aliens are. Yeah. Uh, for, for me, the best alien ever was The Blob. Oh, God, is that great? Right. Steve McQueen, I think it was a B movie, um, oh. The Blob. It, it didn't look like anything on Earth. And, if, oh. and you have to really be a Blob fan to remember that when The Blob arrived on Earth, it was completely transparent. It was colorless. Yes. After it consumed its first victim, it was red for the rest of the movie. Yeah. So okay. uh, was was it the blood uh, in in? Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to assume that, right? Right. Exactly. So so the point is, this is functioning in a way that nothing else on Earth functions, and it can come under it through the grill of your of, of you know the the vents of your air conditioning ducts, right. and and re connect as it goes under the your door stop oh there's a clip from <laughs> it <laughs> look at that yeah the movie theater there it is yeah it had a it had some kind of a a, a mind to it or, or at least in well, hungry instincts just, uh, where it knew it had to eat uh yeah it was a hungry alien so it, yeah so i thought that was quite imaginative so my my challenge to hollywood is make your aliens at least as different from us <laughs> as other exotic <laughs> life forms are on earth relative to us is that too much to ask yeah there's always just one other type of life form when uh, a planet is inhabited by aliens in the a lot of these older movies uh they don't have a variety of life they don't have an, an no, ocean just, just or... even the one we're trying to talk to let it look more different from us than every other life form on earth looks from us <laughs> yeah, maybe because not on speak earth we all English. share common dna <laughs> if you have, I, we have you have dna in common with a banana <laughs> yeah and i presume you have no dna in common with an alien from another planet right so the alien from another planet should look more different from you than you look like from a banana yeah and then i, I guess um uh, not just genetically, but environmentally. If you look at, if there was any type of life form on Jupiter, it would have to deal with the insane gravity and, and pressures and heat and different uh, it would, atmosphere. It would, it, it would just evolve into that environment right. and it would start saying, oh, this environment is made just for me. <laughs> right. So, so to say that life couldn't exist on these planets is very, again, pompous and and. Uh, no, but you're allowed. True, but you're allowed to say life as we know it. As exist. we know it. Well, yeah. yeah. People don't throw that little detail in, do they? Yeah, I, I try to every time. Yeah. Very good, Neil. Neil, I have seen you uh, or heard you at the uh, Hayden Planetarium. Um, just uh, it was so good to hear. Like, look, I've spoken to Neil. I, I I love having you on the show and discussing things. And then I'm sitting in the planetarium and I hear Neil's voice talking about, um, I believe it was uh, Dark Matter. Uh, the Dark uh, Universe. <laughs> yes. And I'm sitting there and I'm I'm elbowing my girlfriend going, yeah, I know this guy. Come on. It's Neil. <laughs> I know this guy. But it was, uh, it, it's so great. All the things you get involved with, um, they're very comfortable for the layman. Which, which is nice because the first thing, especially something like quantum physics, you pick up a book or watch something on quantum physics, the first page, the introduction could make you uh, uh, lose your mind. And you have a way of uh, uh, discussing these things that would be very difficult for some people to understand. And uh, it's greatly appreciated. Well, thank you. But just so you know, it, it, that's the product of a lot of effort thinking about how people think. Because that only then can you claim to be communicating. Otherwise, you're just lecturing. Right. right. You know what is a what is a lecture? You face the chalkboard and just and you know and you get it or you don't. Right. That's a lecture. If you want to communicate, it, it's a contract you have with the person who's reading what you've written or is listening to you speak. And that contract is, I'm going to meet you somewhere in between, maybe all the way up, like right at your doorstep. And depending on the needs of the person or what their educational background is or what their curiosity is. Right. Right. Uh, you're cu clearly a curious guy and you've done a lot of reading and a lot of fun things on your own. So I can meet you in a different place on the street than someone else who might have rejected science their entire lives or knew nothing of it or has been sheltered from it. So I have to, uh, this is an active calculation I'm making at every time <laughs> I'm communicating. It works out well with Star Talk and uh, whatnot. How's how's Chuck? You still uh, Chuck? <laughs> I love Chuck, man. I've known him Chuck. for Chuck I've like... known Chuck for twenty years now, and uh, he's just a great guy.
Wait, wait, you knew Chuck before I knew Chuck? I knew Chuck since WNEW what? days back in 1999, 2000. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Chuck, my co-host on Star Talk. Yes. My, my principal, we have other co-hosts, but he's the principal one. Mm -hmm. Where And my co-host is, as is Chuck, a professional stand-up comedian yep. who brings the levity to the content that comes to the topics that I otherwise think of as gravity. And, and so I have a knob that is always trying to... <laughs> balance those two forces for the listener yeah hell it works man uh, but one other thing yeah uh, so cosmos is going to come out on fox yes. in september yeah you're you're doing that yeah yeah so cosmos uh, first aired on the national geographic channel but what happened was there was a uh, it was a, a divorce of kinds where disney bought fox and fox owned national geographic but the part of fox that disney did not buy which includes Fox News, Fox Business, Fox uh, Sports, I think, and Fox Flagship. They didn't buy those. They only bought the Fox Studios, 20th Century Fox, um, and all the rest of that, which included uh, in the portfolio National Geographic. No. So <laughs> Cosmos was a joint project of National Geographic and Fox Flagship. So when Disney split the kingdom, Fox said, well, we're going to air it not with you. We're going to do it on our own schedule. So they were going to air it this summer, but now they uh, put it on the fall. So beginning September 22nd, I think. 13th so is Cosmos Possible Worlds. Is the yeah, world. Possible Worlds. Cosmos Possible Worlds. What yeah. a great uh, what a great time. I, I love talking to you uh, anytime. And just in the spirit I mean of a lot of what this conversation has been, uh, Cosmos, one of its most important DNA strands is that it will confront what is a challenge in the world. We can call them problems, but let me, as, as a scientist... Uh, I, I think of them as challenges. We confront the challenges and gives you a, a thread of hope about how we might solve it so that we can become better shepherds of our own civilization as we go forward. Wow. And so, in 2020, that's pretty important. Yeah, these so days. Cosmic, exactly. <laughs> and it's some optimism. Ever, there was a need for this. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is here and it is now. And Andrean, who is the, uh, the co-writer of th that series, in fact, she, she's, on, on the on the docket for all three cosmos, going back to the original one with Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan She's kind yeah. of the secret sauce that brings the science into a into a human dimension, right? Because uh, you know any scientist can talk to science, but how do you make it real? How do you make it important to a person on the street? Right, and so relatable she, and how it affects re you. relatable in a way that can call you to action. Your with, master you class did that call. very well. Oh Let's yeah, the master class, yeah, I took your yeah. master class. It was really good, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was really another thing good. that came out in the last few months. Because yeah. I'm one of those people who I don't understand science. That's why I haven't said much during this and just enjoyed <laughs> the conversation. Oh, where, 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 is the, where is he? Yeah. Where is he? Hey, Dave, where, where? What happened to Dave? Yeah, I, I, so yeah, I, I just uh, I really enjoyed your master class, and I think the way that you do put things to people makes it very coherent for somebody like me who went to high school for five years and was high the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Eight years of college down the drain. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so uh what do you think what do you think of what Elon and SpaceX are doing? Uh it's it's kind of refreshing to see a private enterprise um taking the reins and doing things at uh, an amazingly lower cost than NASA, and without all the these bureaucratic restrictions that the government puts on NASA, they, they didn't know what their budget would be year to year, so they couldn't really plan ahead. And the innovations and, and fresh thinking and chances that SpaceX seems to be taking have really paid off, and I'm really impressed with what I've seen with uh, these Falcon uh, uh, rockets that come back and land um the the crew dragon capsule uh it's just really seems to be they've stepped up the technology embraced it and are really running with it over there right what they're trying to do is by the way nasa has collaborated with private enterprise ever since the beginning the difference is that back then they were all to nasa specs mm -hmm. right so the lem you may remember Sure. Um, Made right here on Long Island built. by Grumman. On Long Island. The Grumman Beth Corporation in Bethpage. Bethpage and Lawrence. People still stand tall and proud. Oh, they should for be. Having had aunts and uncles who worked on that project. So, but it didn't say Grumman on the lander. It said USA. Why? Yeah. Because these were NASA said, we need this, build it, here it is, and then we'll use it. 
what's different about SpaceX is that NASA doesn't have a way to get to the get to, to our to the space station, and so they look around and say, "Okay, who's got a spaceship for us?" And then Elon says, "We have one," <laughs> and and so then we just they just buy the spaceship that is pre-existing, and then and so the NASA is now using commercially provided, essentially not quite off the shelf, but I'll call it that off the shelf rocketry <laughs> to complete its task, and that's no different from the U.S. Postal Service in the day. Now, Anthony, you'll remember this back in the 1930s. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was one of the great drivers that promoted the development of flight was the government said, we want an airplane to, to take airmail, okay? Who, uh, we're going to sign a contract, and it's a very lucrative contract. So I'll build a plane, and I win the contract. But wait, Anthony, you've got a plane that you uses less fuel, has a bigger cargo space, and now you come in, and then you take my contract. And I say, damn, okay, let me try to make a better plane ah. than you did. So now I make a better plane that's even bigger, even more efficient. And then I realize, hey, I don't need to take mail. I can take people. <laughs> 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 yeah, competition. So today, today the Postal Service flies their mail in the belly of Delta Airlines or American Airlines or whatever. There's mm -hmm. no Postal Service airplane right. out there. So uh, you can imagine a future where all of the re very repeatable tasks that NASA undertakes, including getting back and forth to orbit, is just done by commercial enterprise. This, is, this should have been happening decades ago. Yeah. Where the press gets it wrong is they report this as private enterprise leading a space frontier. No, they're coming after the fact, doing routine things more efficiently. You know what's uh, odd, though? You, you always looked at, at least I did uh, growing up, looked at the space program as something so untouchable to the private sector and so impossible and when you watch something like SpaceX and Elon and, and you see the progression from the beginning of these ships exploding on the pad like most new ships do to successfully launching and bringing these things back uh, and realize it, it takes that that inaccessibility away and that mysterious layer that is space uh, away okay. from 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 normal people and makes it like oh i understand this i see how they get it up there and and back again okay so you're half right <laughs> <laughs> better to be half right <laughs> no the half right is a very important part that's right <laughs> which is uh Space is hard, and there'll be a lot of failed experiments, and Elon has been very open about these failures. In fact, they compiled a list of, you know, the, the way the engineer puts it, it's a rocket that explodes on the launch pad. That's not a failure. That's an experiment rich in a lot of data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's goofed on a lot of his uh, uh, experiments. <laughs> okay, so, 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 so that opening that up to... The, the transparency of that. Uh, by the way, that's what goes on there is true in any scientific and engineering enterprise. There will always be failures. They just, they are, sometimes in an engineering project, a failure is not interesting to the press. If there's not mm. an explosion, right. it's not interesting. The box didn't work. Okay, <laughs> let's redesign the box. Well, show me good footage of that. No, it just sat there, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the footage, yeah. drones that don't fly is not interesting. It's just okay. sitting there, yeah. <laughs> just sitting there, all right. So, so here is the, the half where you're not quite right, which is, um, we already launched spaceships into orbit. We've already built space stations. We, the government, we have landed on asteroids. The government. We have tracked comets. The government. We have. Um, uh, have reusable hardware, the government, okay? So to see Elon Musk have a spaceship that explodes on the launch pad, that happened 50 years ago <laughs> with NASA. Yeah, yeah. That's not a new thing. So on That's the shoulders of greatness, so Elon what built. The benefit that Elon has is that all these things have already been attempted and accomplished. 
So all he has to, not all, it's still a lot of work. What he has to do is look at what succeeded, do more of that, do less of what failed, and then try to figure out how to do it on the cheap. Yeah, which so, is a big part of it, I guess. And that's, I think, the biggest part of it. <laughs> So there was the headline when Elon Musk took cargo to the space station. It was new era in space exploration. Private enterprise will lead. Then I did. They're not leading anything. They took cargo to the space station. NASA has been doing that for 20 years. OK, so now we can do it for less. Good. I'm glad. Let's do let's do it for less. Yeah. OK, so the first the first entities that will do things in space that are expensive and dangerous historically or anything expensive and dangerous in the history of civilization has not been private enterprise because there's no obvious way to monetize that mm. yet. Yeah. And to monetize example, failures give, are pretty hard, <laughs> very hard to do, but a government can do it because the government might have geopolitical drivers yes. that where they have objectives, world domination, whatever it is. <laughs> okay. I mean, let's, let's go back to Columbus again. I can't, I can't shake this example. So, Columbus was not sent by private enterprise. There was some private investment in it that fed the, 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 the crown, but basically Queen Isabella, Ferdinand, they sent them. And did they say to, Colum to Chris, Chris, when you come back, give us a slideshow of what you saw. No, that's not what they asked him to do. <laughs> Plus they'd have to invent slides. Right. <laughs> yeah. What they said was, here's a satchel of flags. Go plant them wherever you land in the name of Spain. So there was a geopolitical driver Sure. To justify that investment. After Columbus went to the New World. After. And he came back and knew where the, the trade winds are and the hostels and the friendly. After that, then the Dust East India Trading Company decided to uh, um, trade. Right. So you have the private enterprise coming in after the risks are assessed. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a repeated phenomenon ever since the beginning. Of all of this absolutely wow so so interesting man it, it, I, I think what i see and what i i may have misinterpreted sir was the uh yes taking those successes leaving the failures behind but this incorporation of the newest technology a lot of new innovations like i said uh this this and i know nasa and and uh the space shuttle uh especially toward the the later iterations of, of the space shuttles had a lot of autonomous uh, equipment on there. But w I think we're seeing, I think autonomy in, in the ma our machines are one of the biggest things we've seen in the last decade as far as the space program goes. But also, like I said before, automobiles, uh, airlines. Not I think people. We're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think we're, I think that technology... Uh, the ability for a machine to, to this artificial intelligence we've always heard about is really being utilized now. And I think it's it's uh, uh, working uh, really well as far as. Uh, yeah, correct. It, it's basically no one wants to call it this because they think of it as something else because they've seen movies. Right. But it's all some degree of artificial intelligence when you have autonomous craft. The for example, the rover that's going to land on Mars, uh, the entire entry and descent, that's completely automated. Yeah. And it's, as it has to be, because Mars is sufficiently far away, you can't tell the rover, watch out for the cliff. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> yeah. The light travel time for your signal, it will get there after the thing had to make the decision on its own. Yeah. So these are, this, these are bits of AI working into our lives which I think are bringing a comfort level. You know, who the first time you took one of those trams, no, the, the, those in the subway from one um, terminal to another. Oh yeah, where, yeah, like Orlando and stuff. Yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no driver. No one's driving it. it. Yeah, the first time that might have been a little weird. Now it's like, okay, just get me there. I don't care who's. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's that relationship between the sensors. Uh, that they have on these vehicles and the that artificial intelligence brain that the vehicle Correct. has. And, Correct. And, and those have and gotten so And one point so I wanted to make that I should have earlier, you, you were wondering about supplies on Mars. The, the way you would do that is you would send supply ships in advance. Right. So uncrewed supply ships. And then they're there waiting for the... And you can land it even. And so, by the way, precision... Um, orbital mechanics allows you to land where next to where the supplies are, right? <laughs> Not right, somewhere yeah. else on the planet. Yeah.
Um, so so you, you put the supplies in advance and then, you know, think think about it. There are people who live in the desert where everything that's, that sustains them has to be brought in. Mm -hmm. So so this model is not unusual. It's doable. Live in a Look at Las Vegas. There's no natural resources there for... You know, the, the thing is, uh, the thing is, it, it, you know, for it to take over a year for some spontaneous thing that happened and you need uh, equipment to, to remedy it in days, you know, you have to pre-plan all those supplies. No, no, no. You don't over. have to pre-plan it. No, 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 no. no. So, yes, that's the way. That's the. Yes. However, one way to pre-plan is to build the capacity to repair things not knowing in advance what you might need to repair. So what would that be? That'd be a 3D printer. Oh, there you go. Right. Now you could make the things that see, see. Okay. So, so what you do is, so I've, <laughs> I've the, the 3D printers I've seen, I, I saw one at NASA. So here's one where you put in aluminum dust and then it heats the aluminum dust and oh, merges wow. it. And out the other side came a fan blade that you would use it to cool a, a, a computer system. And I'm saying, this, a blade has got this sort of three-dimensional curvature to it. It's not just a block object. Right, right. And I said, hey, this is good. And, and so, yeah, so you just set it up so you just build whatever you need. And when, I, when I saw a 3D printer make something that was linked, that was completely separate, like two pieces of a chain link that, that were connected but not uh, attached to each other, I was like, how the hell... Is that done in a printer? There are some really amazing things going on. Yeah. Right so now. what you do is you set up the capacity to create everything that you need to sustain yourself, so that if any of the things break, you just make it again. What do you or think? Or you the have most a way to dig into the soils to get the 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 carbon dioxide. The the well, there's, we think there's water in a permafrost below. By the way, you can get oxygen not only from carbon dioxide but from the water molecule. Sure. H two O. What What do you think the most important things to f to have on Mars before any people are sent uh, would be I would think some type of um, a, a medical thing I mean, perhaps a sick bay type of uh, thing uh, that's another good that's another good um, okay did you see the movie Prometheus yes sure okay yeah for me one of the most striking stunning suspenseful scenes was when she, the the lead uh, character she's she's um she has the alien fetus inside oh yeah of her. yeah oh yeah that was and crazy. she wants to perform an abortion and yeah. she goes up to one of these pods so it's a medical pod and you you dial in the surgery that you want oh my yeah, God. yeah. yeah. And then, but the problem was the medical the female medical pod was broken so she had to perform an abortion in a male medical pod. So, so she had to override the commands and give the, the raw commands for what the thing needed to it's, it's, The thing is happening and the alien is gurgling inside <laughs> yeah, her. Yeah, and was... <laughs> so for me, an interesting future would be not did you bring the emergency kit, is you have an entire thing that knows how to operate on every one of your organs. Oh, geez. Wow. That, that would, would be, be the AI amazing. of surgery. Yeah. And, you know, with what we've seen over the past uh, couple of decades technologically, I can't ever look at something and go, well, that couldn't be. That's impossible. That couldn't be done. Uh, it's, it's, it's all amazing. Uh, we're going to let you go, Neil. You, you're just such a joy to have on this show. I love when you come on to discuss things well, I, with I, you. I, you're, I appreciate your enthusiasm, which is palpable. And, um, you know, you're part of the you're part of the community of people who share this enthusiasm with others so that they can embrace the future knowing that science and technology has to be a fundamental part. Yes. Otherwise, we just move backwards on the on the evolutionary chain. Ab absolutely, man. Uh, we got Cosmos Possible Worlds uh, available on Dis Disney Plus and uh, on demand on National Geographic. And, uh, of course, Emmy-nominated Star Talk on National Geographic Channel. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, thanks so much, my friend. Thank you. So good to talk to you. Excellent. Good to see you again. Be safe. There he goes, Neil. I, I, I love that guy.